All right, welcome to Orthodox Christian Theology. And according to John, I'm the host of Orthodox Christian Theology, Craig Trulia. And John? He's the host of According to John. And he is the host of According to John, uh, up and coming YouTube channel. And uh, today we're doing our first uh, Orthodox Q&A. And I'm just, wait, that's the wrong ticker. And pretty much we're going to cover random topics, and I hope audience questions for those so inclined to go on. And John came up the topics, so blame him. So wow. our first topic today will be orthodoxy in Cambodia. And uh, so you spell Cambodia. Is that, is that Greek for Cambodia? I just Googled it. <laughs> I mean, I need to see. Maybe it's Swedish. <laughs> It could be sweet because Cambodia, I think maybe it would be uh, Romanian or something like that, right? And uh, so for our first topic today is Orthodox in Cambodia. But here's the thing. In Cambodia, it's Kampuchea. Okay. All right? So that's what they really call themselves. Like, stupid question. We're speaking English. What's Greece actually called in Greece? Elava. It's Hellas, you know. Elenas. A lot. Hellenic. So it's not, it sounds more like ice cream in Spanish than it sounds like yeah. Greece. As the word not. Greek is an insult, insult on Greece. <laughs> it's like a Man, German insult. Like so, yeah. so you're Elada. Yeah. Elada. Okay. You know Hellas. Yeah. 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 It's okay. So I just learned something today, but I will add this. Orthodoxy in Cambodia, the Cambodians aren't quite so picky with what you call them. The French call them Cambodge. They... They mm. call themselves Kampuchea. They, they don't care. And it's they don't have a sense of history mm. like particularly Europeans do because they have an older history. Um, but that being said, we have the issue that orthodoxy is starting to take off in Cambodia, which is really interesting um, because it was actually started by the Bulgarians. The Bulgarians have wow. a small um, temple in their embassy. And so there's always been, particularly in the Soviet era, um, there would be Romanians, Bulgarians, Russians, because Cambodia was aligned with Vietnam and still are. And so they were aligned with the Soviet bloc against the Chinese. So this is Orthodoxy's first inroads in Cambodia. So imagine you are a random Bulgarian, Russian, whatever, live in Cambodia. And they were not making many converts, as far as I know, at this time. You may have a priest visiting. You may not. So the, I actually read one article. They went years without a priest visiting. Now, um, you grew up in Sweden. So I think there's enough Greeks. I feel bad calling you guys Greeks. <laughs> Please forgive me. <laughs> yeah, I have to. <laughs> there's enough Greeks in Sweden where you never had that issue where you're waiting for a priest to come through. Um, in parts and remote parts of Russia, um, they might have a priest come through once a year. And that's why Russia is trying to build as many uh, temples and, uh, and ordain as many priests as possible. They're doing it by the thousands every year, exactly for that reason. So Cambodia had a very similar, though with a smaller amount of people, kind of way of going about things. But in 2013, it really started taking off when they started building larger temples outside the Bulgarian embassy. And this was the Moscow Patriarchate. Yeah. Um, those who are curious, the Moscow Patriarchate, um, generally, stereotypically, is the most evangelistic. And it's because the Russians were, have been converting people when they were expanding their empire with much more ethnic diversity than was typical of other Orthodox countries. And so they already made inroads um, in the Philippines, in Indonesia, and in Malaysia, and all, all these different areas. And so it kind of made sense, also Thailand, by the way, that to also do work in Cambodia. Sadly, not Vietnam, because Orthodox Christianity is illegal in Vietnam. And so though there are some Orthodox, they are not allowed to do worship. So anything that happens there, we don't know. It's all done underground. Mm -hmm. um, so how so many we, people are Orthodox in Cambodia? Like, do you have uh, hundreds, thousands? Yeah, I don't or? think it's a ton. I, th I think we're talking about like a hundred or so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't think we're talking about a, a yeah. whole ton of Orthodox in, um, in Cambodia. 
Um, yeah. They're slowly making converts and they're doing charitable work. They only have two temples. Um, yeah. And a lot of the cradle Orthodox from other lands, because obviously the Cambodians are converts, um, a lot of the cradle Orthodox are more passing through, right? They're either on vacation or they're working for an NGO for a year. They're not like, mm -hmm. most aren't living long-term in Cambodia. So for example, in Phnom Penh, the liturgical language is of course, Old Church Slavonic, because again, we're talking Russians, yeah. um, Cambodian, which makes sense because we're talking Cambodians, they call the language, um, my wife would kill me, Khmer, uh, by the way. So if you hear Khmer or Khmer Rouge, it's because they're Cambodians. And um, English. And I knew that Father Paisi, he's Moldovan, and he's the mm -hmm. priest in Phnom Penh. Father Roman's the priest in Sinopil. I asked Father uh, Paisi, I'm like, how is it in English? I mean, like, I know you speak English because we're speaking to each other, but how is it in English? He says, because there's South Africans here that are Orthodox and Eng they speak English and English is one of the few languages all of us from different countries have in common. So you have a Romanian, you have a Greek, you have a Russian, you have a South African. What's the one language they could all speak? And that would be English. And I'm just lowering my volume here. They got all loud all of a sudden in my ear. <laughs> so that being said, um, it's a very interesting mixed bag there. It's growing, and which is why if people look in the ticker down there, um, we raise money. My channel with Dr. Theology, um, we may raise money for churches in Cambodia um, for their growth, but it's because they're pretty new. Um, they're just finished, their temples were just finished in 2015. Um, so it's very much a missionary religion there. They're still translating saints' lives. Um, the scriptures have already been translated, so they don't need to translate those. Um, but they don't have the Deuterocanon translated, for example. So these are all things eventually we will have to do. Are, are people like uh, responding good to the to the Orthodox faith? Are they uh, or they or do they feel it's something foreign? Um, it's. Cambodia is a mixed bag because in some ways, orthodoxy has a lot in common with native Cambodian religion, mm -hmm. you know, um, but that could be a bad thing when it comes to making converts in Cambodia because the allure of Christianity in Cambodia is that it's modern, it's Western, it's advanced. They have a very negative view of themselves. You know, we're poor, we're backward, we need to become more like the West. And so mm -hmm. they're not so discerning. Russians, Greeks, they're just as Western as Americans. They're just as Western mm -hmm. as Englishmen, right? Because they're white. That's how they view it. <laughs> the, the word in Khmer is Paran, which just means French. They call all white people French. Mm -hmm. And so I think it actually hurts. Another thing that hurts is we're not big enough in Cambodia. So um, God bless them. The Protestants open up schools, English schools, and Cambodians want their kids to learn English. And so your mm -hmm. kid goes to school, they learn math, they learn English, they learn how to write in Kamai as well, but they mm -hmm. also learn um, Christianity, right? So they learn Christianity on top of this. And so that's how you make converts. That's how the Roman Catholic Church made converts to Unitism in Lebanon, for example. They were the ones that were able to open the schools in the Ottoman Empire yeah. so they'd have well, some level of diplomatic immunity. Yeah, I feel we Orthodox are very bad at that. At that. For example, in USA, wh why isn't it more uh, schools, you know? Uh, it, it should be the first thing that we do, I think, uh, maybe. Well, let me give the litany of Orthodox excuses. In America, we're too small. Uh, in uh, Europe, the Turks and, and the communists, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> those, those are the excuses. I, I just but was yeah, sorry. Ayos Cosmas uh, opened, I think, 200 schools during the Ottoman Empire alone by walking on foot. So I don't buy that excuse. Yeah. Well, part of it. And, and yeah. there's a reason you remember him. He did something that was exceptional. Uh, yeah. But obviously, you know, when you are under the thumb of an, of an oppressive regime, you're not going to raise the capital to open schools like American and English Protestants with zero persecution. Right. Like um, I'm an American. The question is like, how do we give away money? It's not because we were rich, but like even middle class people could give somewhat substantial funds to churches and stuff like that. And so it's the vote of dollars. And I think that's a big part of it. Also, I don't think people realize the importance of 
evangelism and particularly yeah. opening of schools. Yeah. Um, I think Orthodox are losing their own people, even in native lands, because once people start interacting online, they start, they start coming against people much more educated in their respective traditions, you know, whether it be Roman Catholicism, whether it be Protestantism. So for those listening, um, yes, we need education. We want to open schools in Cambodia. We want to open schools in America. But we don't even really, I don't even know where the closest Orthodox schools in America. And I live in New York State. That's like a state that people actually know exists. If I told you Nebraska and you're a foreigner, you might not even know Nebraska is a state in America. It's like a, so Saskatchewan is a province in Canada. You probably never heard of that either if you're outside of Canada. So it's like, you know, I'm in a big state and we don't have an Orthodox school for, as far as I could tell. So we got issues when it comes to education, but we got tons of Roman Catholic schools. And depending on laws, my son may end up going to Roman Catholic school. Yeah. And if Roman Catholics are more into making converts, <laughs> that's that would be something that they could do. Um, so, yeah, it's interesting. This was one of our topics was education. So let's talk about it. What, yeah. what do you have in your mind about education? Oh, I, I thought more in terms of, you know, of, of bringing, you know, your children, how, sh how well, you should that, think about that. That's part of it, though, bringing up your kids, right? Yeah. You're in Greece. Do they have, does everyone just go to public school or do they have religious schools? Uh, uh, they have uh, public schools here. And from four years old, you're, uh, you need to go to them. Um, but I know also at high school level, there exists uh, religious schools. I think even one in Ayanoros. So, and of course, mm -hmm. at the university levels, there exist many also. So, but also here in Greece, at every public school, they have morning prayers, uh, for example. So, the religion, wow. even in. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so my. Daughter, prayer in school in Greece. Yeah, so my daughter started now. She's four at public school and she come home and said oh we said the, the our father and the, you know accionist in and some prayers so that that's nice that's uh, that makes me feel good at least <laughs> now how do they have prayer but there's legalized abortion in, in elada right in greece yeah in greece there is like but how do you have that you got abortion and your kids do the morning prayers in school how, how do you have that and your bishops and priests are paid for by the taxpayer so how do you have that? That's a good question. I, I mean, a historian needs to answer that. But my answer is that Greece is a divided country. Um, we had a civil war just uh, this uh, century. So we need to remember that. And uh, one part of that civil war was the communists, you know, the atheists. <laughs> so <laughs> maybe that's an over uh, simplicity. See, see that, that's a trope in orthodoxy. It's well, always the Turks so, uh, or the communists um, fall. Yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> no, but um, so maybe, so in Greece, I mean, there are many people that hate priests and, you know, th so there's a general respect for priests, but um, I mean, people are like, oh, are you going to be priests? Uh, like that. So th there is, Greece is a, very, is a secular country as well as men, a religious country in some strange way. And so how do you plan on educating your kids and how are they being educated? Because your kids are a little older than my child. I will give her to the state. No, I'm kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> you do it. <laughs> yeah, you do it. I mean, well, I'm father. I have no responsibilities. Uh, so, <laughs> well, the first move was to move to Greece. You know, uh, I have some concerns in Sweden where they teach some strange uh, gender stuff but um yeah i think mm -hmm. uh, i want to have a, a pray a, a life you know in prayer at home going to church talking about these things from the beginning um so and uh, yeah that's basically it you know being involved in the children's life my wife and i live in new york state and so there's a certain vaccination schedule that you have to have in order for your kids to go to public schools or even private schools, and you cannot have a religious exemption. And um, to be perfectly honest, I'm not religiously opposed to vaccinations as long as they're not sourced by you know human material, fetal tissue. Um, but also, I'm one of those sticklers of science, and right, I believe in medicine if 
statistically, it's going to help you. So polio, for example, has been eliminated from everywhere other than Central Africa. That Even India hasn't had a case of polio since 2015, right? So if you have zero risk in polio, even in India, right? It's like, why are we still vaccinating children with this when you could get a, a medically transmitted infection, you know, in a doctor's office, it's a place that breeds germs. So my wife and I are considering not vaccinating for that reason. And due to that, that means we, our child will have to go to be homeschooled. And so there'd be a religious education because it'd be homeschooled, but also my, my child's very young. He's really just learning mama, papa, how to go in the potty at this point. Yeah. So I would say it would be depending upon one, what his, his capacity to learn in a home environment would be, because if not, then he gets the shots and you'll go to a Roman Catholic school, but absolutely not to a public school, it's secular propaganda. Um, yeah. And it's not, it's, I could kind of deal with a secular education, which didn't have an agenda, mm -hmm. but the secular education has an agenda that actually is anti-religious and that's where yeah. it becomes problematic and yeah. it's also anti-scientific right xx yeah. and xy chromosome doesn't mean anything anymore right yeah. history it's like the book 1984 history is about making people feel good it's not telling people what actually happened <laughs> so yeah. it's like why am i bringing my kid to school if he's actually not learning yeah. he's being propagandized in school so yeah. um anyway we're not bishops. We're telling you as two parents, our view of education, um, yeah. you know, but at least in Greece, they got the morning prayers. I think that's pretty cool. That's a good start. Um, so let's talk about the future of America, because this is your idea. It's not me being super American. And then maybe oh. we'll take an audience question. The future of America and the election. Um, I was speaking to a Romanian friend of mine yesterday. He just came back from Romania to America. And... Mm -hmm. He was telling me, this is his opinion, I'm not saying it's true. He said, we in Europe are looking to see what's going to happen in America, to see the future of Europe. And what he was saying is he viewed the election of Joe Biden and Kamala Harris as indicative of a totalitarian regime, you know, kind of sort of like the Soviets, you know, mm -hmm. or the, the respective communist parties in Europe taking over the United States. So that was an interesting view from a Romanian um, yeah. Another kind of stereotype, though, is that Russians, Bulgarians, Romanians, they're all conspiracy theorists. So, like, we Americans don't know much about these native European stereotypes, but the stereotype is they're conspiracy theorists. <laughs> so, the um, what's your view, being that you brought up the topic? Well, first, let me comment on that, uh, uh, that they are conspiracy, uh, ah. uh, that they have many conspiracy can you say the word? <laughs> Conspiracy theorist. Thank you. Well, I mean, in one sense, you can understand them because because they had a government, you know, that really conspired against them, but for a long time. Anyway, I, well, wow, it's a hard question. I think that the, hmm, I think Americans should keep some of their traditions, you know, the, the good traditions, not the bad ones. And uh, don't fall for this secularistic, um, uh, you know, BS. Uh, <laughs> because, yeah. Yeah. Well, in, the United, in the United States, though, one of our time-honored traditions, like you said, not your bad ones, is a separation of church and state. Yeah. Now, what that really meant in the 17 and 1800s was that the United States didn't have state churches. So, right, like yeah. we didn't give money to the Roman Catholic Church, to the Anglican Church, or Episcopalian, etc. cetera. Um, but they still had prayer in schools. They still had prayer in Congress. They, to this day, have prayer yeah. in Congress. Um, so the idea was not that, like, anything that was religious couldn't ever get any state support in any way. That, that's been kind of a 20th century perversion where if you're going to have a statue, yeah, exactly. right? If you're going to have a Christmas tree, you have to have a menorah. If you're going to have a um, statue, I'm just going to say of Moses and 10 commandments, which really isn't very religious has to do with law. Like the Supreme court yeah. actually has Moses and the 10 and the 10 commandments on, on yeah. it. If you look at the building. Um, 
But if you're going to have that, then you're going to have to have Satan holding a cross upside down with his foot on a kid. And you have to let yeah. them have a statue of that too, which of course would have made no sense to Thomas Jefferson. And he wasn't a Christian, yeah. he was a deist. Right? Yeah. He understood that's not what we mean by separation church and state. But yeah. modern Americans are idiots and they're not educated. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's like uh, religious people saying, oh, we need to have separation of church and state. So no, go no government can uh, create a law that affects the church. In the church, you can do everything. You can you know kill people if you want because there is separation. Uh, nobody will uh, would uh, you know accept that. And so it's a term that is really needs to be defined better. And I think it was defined pretty good, but uh, people, yeah, they are interpreting interpreting it in a way that suits their own goals and uh, wants in life. But um, because in reality, yeah. it's not a separation of church and state. It's yeah. it's integrating the church of secular values of secular secular religion and not the yeah. Christian religion, not the Jewish religion. Yeah. And you know, right now that the new group to be all kind to are Muslims. And to be honest, it's a relationship of convenience. If they were to exert themselves too strongly, they'll clamp down on them hard. Um, yeah. You know, you, you take these lovey-dovey Western European countries like France, that, you know, that want to integrate people. You can't wear a cross and you can't wear a hijab in France. It's against the law. Um, yeah. it's, it's still against law in Turkey. I think they just changed that law in Tunisia, but it's still against law in Morocco. So people like in the United States don't get that. They, they don't get that European, North African, Turkey, which is really within that Western European orbit more than the Middle Eastern orbit. Yeah. Um, they're not about religious freedom. <laughs> That's in a very no. distinctly American thing. And so this idea that, you know, the fact that we allow Muslims here to dress however they want would make us different than other countries in the United States. Now, yeah. Greece has a terrible history with Muslims. It's like Turkey has a terrible history with Greeks. So, like, are there any Muslims left in Elada? That's Greece for the... In Greece. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, I love that. Yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, in uh, northern uh, eastern Greece, in Thraki, where, where it, uh, the border to, the Tur uh, to Turkey, mm -hmm. there is uh, a lot of Muslims. And, uh, yeah, so there are still... But there was, um, I think now, 100 years ago, a population exchange. So Turkey yeah, threw all the Christians Greece. out. Yeah. And Greece did the same. But there are still uh, uh, Muslims in Greece, of course. Yeah. So what is your, what do you, do you anticipate? Well, first, what do you guys hear out in Europe about Donald Trump, our president, um, and about this yeah. election? What is your news coverage of it? Well, the media is, has one view, and that's uh, Donald Trump is the great oh. Satan, almost. Yeah, it's yeah. interesting how that's worldwide. <laughs> yeah, it's worldwide. But I I listen to also other sources. You know, I I, list, I try to listen some to Ben Shapiro and others to have a balanced uh, view. And uh, many times I try to like in the debate uh, yeah, that uh, was Biden and Trump. I listened first to the debate, debate and then to what the news had to say because I wanted my own opinion. And uh, you know, I uh, yeah, I don't I don't feel it, they are saying the truth. And you know, when <clears throat> if you really hate Trump, it doesn't serve your purpose if you ex exaggerate that uh, the wrongdoings of. Uh, you're only giving fuel to the other side and uh, so really I don't agree with hating him but you know if you do it it's really strange strategy uh, strategy to to say things that are not true of him you know well it's disconcerting that people hate someone they never met and for the reasons they hate them um, yeah. my wife is an immigrant to the United States her mother-in-law immigrated here during Donald Trump's administration. Where is this racism that people that like, you no, know, there'll be no immigration. And then uh, it's like, yeah. it's like, there's no attention to reality. It's all, they don't like his substance. His substance is awful. Um, I don't yeah. think he's lived a particularly moral life. Um, and he's a yeah. very poor administrator. Um, so these kind of revelations that are coming out that maybe he doesn't have as much money as it looks, it's all image. 
seems somewhat believable because he he's an yeah. awful administrator. He's a terrible yeah. delegator of responsibilities. Yeah. He doesn't keep anyone working for him very long. So there's so many ways he's bad. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, exactly. But the difference is this. Yeah. He, was, he was democratically elected. And an issue in the United States is unlike in Cambodia, where you need three points of ID to vote and they stick your thumb in ink. You know, like these foreign countries are bullied by Western Europe and by the United States saying, you're not free. You don't have free elections. Right. Mm -hmm. You must put all these controls in place and let the U.N. look at you have an election. And it's humiliating. Now, of course, they still throw the elections anyway. But now you go back and, you, and let's say let's go Europe. You go to, let's say, England. They want to leave the EU. They have an election. They'll leave the EU. They can't go. They'll never yeah. leave the EU. Let's be honest. They'll yeah. never let them leave the EU. That, there's no democracy. That's an that's a utter lie. Yeah. And then you have the issue with, let's say, Ireland, who voted no to be in the EU. Then they hold another vote. And they vote yes. Now you're in. Now you can never leave. Basically, yeah. the majority of always So the no vote meant nothing. They could just keep making you vote until by mistake enough yeah. people vote yes, and now you can't yeah. leave. And so the utter arrogance to look at Cambodia or something and say, you're not democratic, but we are, it is, yeah. like I said, it's this utter arrogance. And so in the United States... Our issue has been for our entire history, ever since they had um, universal male voting, because that wasn't the original voting in the United States. Originally in the United States, the voting was just property owners. The idea is the educated should decide things. Now look at religion or orthodox, right? We don't believe, you know, unless you're in Cyprus and you actually vote on your bishop, right? We, yeah. don't, <laughs> we don't believe that like, each member of the church should be making every single decision. We've got bishops for that. We believe in a hierarchy. So the point is, Western society, because it comes from the church, has had these things integrated into their views and politics for a very long time. Yeah. So that being said, when they went to universal male um, voting, um, suffrage, we call it, what happened? It didn't go, we became a freer country and everyone yeah. hugged each other. What happened was tons of voter fraud. <laughs> Because <laughs> now you could pay immigrants. This is we're talking about Tammany Hall and political machines for votes. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to bore people the history le lesson, so we need to go past this topic. But the point is that has never changed. There's much more fraud at the city level than there is in rural areas in the suburbs, and that persists to this day. And so we have elections chosen at the razor wire, you know, in states by a hundred thousand votes. If you have enough false votes in the cities, it doesn't matter how many people come out there and actually vote throughout throughout that state. They could swing an election based on that. And, they're, and they've been catching people now, um, uh, vote, uh, vote harvesting because we're having now mail-in ballots. So you take people's ballots, you fill them in. They don't know that they didn't vote. Yeah. So it's, uh, again, oh, we're America. We're the beacon of freedom throughout the world. And we... We would be embarrassed if we had vote foreign people looking at our elections. In fact, they don't let people here look at it often. They've kicked them out because they're saying, oh, they're causing a disturbance. Yeah. So if you want to do that in your country, maybe not uh, a lot of, which is Greece in particular, but um, in a lot of countries like my wife's country. So we're going to move to a audience question, and then we'll move on to one of our prepared topics after that. And this is from Zebi who's one of our Oriental Orthodox uh, followers. Mm -hmm. And I want you to answer. Okay. Um, what credence do you, John, give to linguistic differences and misunderstandings resulting in the Miaphysite diaphysite schism between the Eastern Orthodox and the Oriental Orthodox? If we look at a map and see who agrees with who, this seems to be an, obvi uh, an obvious possible explanation, right? Because it's the map looks like it's split upon language, right? Mostly Greek versus everything else. Groups who are close to each other seem to agree. I know there's more involved in Calston than this, but curious to what you think. So that's Zebi's question. So what do you think, John? Um, can you still have the question up so I can just... Uh, All right. look at I'm just going to cover your handsome face. <laughs> <All Yeah. right>. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to take that... No, seriously. leave it, leave it then, leave it then. Because there are... There are popular YouTube apologists out there that you call them handsome, they'll do whatever you say. I find that a little creepy and strange. And <laughs> and I'm just joking. All right. Yeah. We're both happily married men. All right. So yes. that's, here's <laughs> a question for John. I'll leave it up there for you. 
How much is the schism between monophysites and diaphysites uh, a matter of terminology and language? Okay, let me first start by saying that this is not a topic I have investigated a lot in. But, um, so let, let us start from the beginning. Yeah, you, I mean, you can do this also between East and West, right? You can say yes. that there are uh, lines, uh, clear lines going between uh, the Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church. So this is the first thing I noticed. Uh, so this is not a unique thing between the Miaphysite uh, and the rest of the Orthodox Churches. And the second thing is that it's not as clear because there are other countries, I think, and places that have uh, this uh, Mia myophysite uh, uh, views but I think that we so so I agree at one level that there is a language and cultural uh, thing here going on there is always that thing but I always all, uh, but I think it's also some dogmatic things and um, what was he said what uh, he yeah said be an obvious explanation. Groups who are close to each other seem to agree. I know there's more involved in Chalcedon. I mean, if that's all you think, um, I can then give yeah. my quick comments. Yeah, I can just say that I can't, sorry. Yeah, continue. All right, so yeah, so long story short, I would, um, I would add this. I think this, my analysis, and I know someone who's a historian that utterly disagrees with me, so I'll just leave it at that, but my analysis, this, this schism has to do with the collapse of the Roman Empire. Um, the Roman Empire was getting very weak and lost the Western half in the fifth century. Um, at the same time, right, if they're losing the Western half of the empire, including the city of Rome itself, they're having more issues keeping control over the periphery of the empire, particularly um, Arab client states and the cops in Egypt. Um, so in this time, more and more really autonomy is being granted to these client states, which have never been granted back in the day when Rome was at their peak, uh, in a way just to extract as much tribute as they could possibly get. And so what we're seeing is a proto-nationalism, meaning, because yeah. nationalism is an anachronism, didn't exist in the 19th century, but a sort of people that are cops, viewing themselves as cops, not as Romans, not as Greeks, right? I mean, if you look at, if you're Egyptian, you have been under foreign domination um, since the Persian Empire. So all they had is Persians, Macedonians, Romans, you know, yeah. it, it's, they never got to really exert themselves in that sense. And so I think this schism is more to do with um, nationality, to use a 19th century term, I am aware it's anachronistic, than it had to do with theology initially. That doesn't mean there weren't theologians at that time with certain views. So clearly, um, Ju um, I think his name is Julian, right? He's a one mon a monophysite. Then we have who used the term Miaphysite, uh, Severian of Antioch. They would have been two different schools of theology, right? Um, but think about it. that schism was already going on for about a century before uh, um, the, uh, Severus actually made the theology and really like worked it out. So wow. how is this schism occurring if the actual doctrines of the schism haven't been formulated yet, if it's not nationalistic? I, I think people really got to seriously think about that. And they say, oh, well, but Chalcedon said two, in two natures, right? They use the word. But if you don't have a theology as to how that, that terminology is wrong, it seems more like a rallying call for a nationalistic dispute than, than a serious theological dispute. So yeah. this episode isn't going to be about solving that question. That'll yeah. just be food to thought. I will add that Zebi's from, I believe he's Carolyn, which is part of India. But Zebi, I'm wrong. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong. But that being said, like Carolyn, from what I know, and this might go to the next question, yeah. um, was originally Nestorian Christians. Yeah. But Nestorians use Syriac. Now, people don't know this. In the 5th century, the Nestorian church was made by Persian law. And at that time... They were the Parthian Empire. No, they turned it to the Sassanid Empire. So at that time was the Sassanid Empire made it law that the only Christians allowed in their empire were Nestorians. There's a reason why Rome had Orthodox and Parthia had Nestorian. 
because the, the, the government apparatuses enforced it. And not so surprisingly, who's in the middle? Egypt, hmm. Syria, Lebanon, you know, where the monophysites were. So the people that weren't really directly under any control or the control kept switching between Persia and, and the Romans were the ones that were part of neither church. So like no one thinks about this. It's so obvious when you look at a map, <laughs> but, it, but no one thinks about this. Yeah. So the historian, interestingly, Christianized um, India, and from what I could tell, but also the Ethiopians, which would have been beginning in the seventh century, aligned with the Oriental Orthodox. They didn't become Oriental Orthodox right away. They were until the seventh century actually in communion with the churches of the Eastern Orthodox. But that aside, I think in Kerala, they never bought super into these divide these div divisions which is why when the Portuguese and then the English started pretty much colonizing the Indians in Kerala, they then went to communion with the Syriac Orthodox who are monophysite. I go, wait a second, they're the complete opposite of the historians because I don't think Christians in Kerala were actually schismatics per se. They were in communion with whoever they could be in communion with. It wasn't until they went into Roman Catholic schismatics and, um, and Anglican schismatics that then they had to find who are we actually in communion with and who's the answer, the people that still have Syriac because that's their liturgical language in India. And so who was that, the Syriac Orthodox? So you see yeah. how that goes? So it's, yeah. it's an interesting question. So we see a question here kind of on that. Hmm. When we think the Nestorian church is further east geographically, the idea that things may have been got lost in translation across geography seems possible. And I think to a great degree, that would be true once we get into the Nestorians in China and Mongolia and in India, um, because really their connection to the rest of Christians was the Syriac language. Um, and they don't seem to have been, like I just anticipated in this question, so invested in the Christological controversy um, that now we see today. Yeah, I think... I think this is um, what I have studied in this subject. I, my conclusion is also that it's not only this uh, political, let's say, uh, thing, because first of all, we have been uh, separate for over 1500 years. And I, I don't think the church, you know, make those kinds of mistakes, condemning an Orthodox church to heresy. Uh, I think that will, I, I have a difficulty to, uh, grasps that uh, I think there are other things going uh, underneath this. Uh, but let me also say that there is not, you know, there had been some kind of also communication. Uh, I'm thinking of a saint, I don't think you have heard of him, but it is called uh, Miletios Pegas, if I'm yeah. No, I haven't heard them. <laughs> yeah, there are Greek saints, let's say, from the 16th, 17th century that are basically unknown, but they're great saints. They studied in West, uh, and he got uh, an opportunity to, if he, you know, became Catholic, to have a good seat and a good place, and he, you know, packed his bag and went back to Greece. So he's like, uh, my, my teacher loves him for that. <laughs> but he, he also worked together with the cop to help them not uh, come closer to the Catholics. So I, I don't want to speak of the Catholic discussion here, but I'm saying that there had been also, you know, um, communication. But I mean, if you look at the council, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the monophysites had, um, uh, uh, they, they had also a council, you know. I read a historian, uh, of a temporary historian that describes this council and he said that the bishop the bishops uh, were you know they got hitted and uh, they they were there were abuse going on so i mean only on that level we see i think some kind of that this was not only um yeah i can re i can send the, the sources later but um, only that shows that this their council they had was not open you know in a in a christian manner so and maybe you can respond to this i'm not sure uh, but if i'm correct when C uh, saint cyril is speaking about one nature he's he in his mind he's thinking of 
the hypost uh, the um, hypostatic uh, union. Yes. So yeah, and using you know that was I think if I remember it what my teacher said. So we need. Well, to yeah, it's it's interesting because yeah. reading Searle's letters, he very obviously differentiates between both natures and affirms both of their existence. Yeah. So yeah. it's yeah, like I said, it seems to me what is now modern, and we could have Deacon Daniel Kakish on. I know he disagrees with me, but what seems to be to be Severian. Um, theology really wasn't formulated in the fifth century, from what I could tell. Um, from what I could tell, it's it really was these national disputes, and because the Nestorianism isn't the force it used to be. I mean, the Monophysites would have been nothing compared to the Nestorians until the Mongols. Mm -hmm. They went all the way to China. They were, you know, all the way to India. They were huge. They were arguably la almost larger than the Church, you know, the Orthodox or the Roman Catholics. So they were huge, but because they don't exist anymore, it doesn't even figure into our thinking. Like when people con consider um, um, conversion to orthodoxy or Roman Catholicism, they don't even consider it historians, even though they still exist, but because they're so yeah. tiny. Yeah. But that would have not been true up until the 1300s. So can that's I, something yeah. people have to take into account. Can I just ask you, maybe you know the answer to this. Uh, <laughs> Uh, when uh, they speak of the Trinity, do they say that there is three natures in the Trinity? I don't think so. I think they still think nature. They still think nature is essence, right? So there would be only so, one essence. So why? But so why think, then do this? Yeah. Why I, speak I, of Christ as having one nature when they mean two natures and not applying it the same to the Trinity? Um, because again. I don't know. You have, to, <laughs> you have to ask them. But I think the term yeah. is more under the word hypostasis, which which we admit in the fifth century actually changed the meaning. So I could see that being something that would create linguistic confusion. Yeah. We got a question from Agnes, who's Agnes is my new favorite name because yeah. I I have a friend whose daughter was just born and named the, the daughter Agnes. So I just find that really cool. Hi, I'm a Protestant. But I love Orthodox teachings. My husband's Roman Catholic. Should a wife convert to Roman Catholic just for the sake of the husband and the kids or go with what I believe? What's, that's a good them. question. I mean, <laughs> I mean, and it's right. It seems like she looks like from the picture, a young parent. We're young parents. So yeah. we're not holy men or great people that could solve such big problems. But we'll go give you a quick opinion. John, you've been a father longer than I. So what's your opinion? I mean, look, I'm I'm not Catholic or Protestant, so you might, what are you going to choose? But I, I, I consider Catholic faith closer to Orthodox than Protestantism. You know, they have a, they venerate the saints, they have a closer faith in that way. But uh, if you are, if you love Orthodox teachings, you should, I mean, you should, with your husband, I think, if you want, uh, consider also the Orthodox Church. But... <sighs> That's a hard question because I'm not orthodox, but I think, orthodox. Let, let me speak on a principle. <laughs> I am orthodox. I mean, I'm not Catholic. <laughs> you are uh, Catholic. You're not Roman Catholic. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. I'm just beating up on you now. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, um, I think, let me speak on a principle level. I think it's important to have unity with, in, within the family. So... It's not ultimate to have, you know, one is Orthodox and Catholic, one is Protestant and one is not. Uh, so, I mean, that's the human situation many times, but, uh, but I think if there can be unity, I think it's good. But there also needs to be truth there. There cannot be unity in falsehood. So if you feel that uh, the Catholics, I mean, yeah. So, so my wife, for example, she was not Orthodox in the beginning. And uh, when she became Orthodox, we really felt much closer to each other because we could speak to each other on a whole diff different level. So let me leave you with that. I don't know if yeah, Craig wants to yeah, correct my, or add. My, wife had a, my wife's testimony is on, on my YouTube channel. And she says, I wasn't totally convinced when, uh, when Craig here right, decided to convert to Orthodoxy. Um, but... I felt it was bad for the marriage if we would be two different religions. So just from a pragmatic standpoint, yes, two different religions is bad. 
I could also tell you from seeing other people's experience, I know of a Orthodox family, one, the spouse went old calendarist and the husband did not. None of the kids are Christian today, not one of them, because they couldn't, and they were brought to church every Sunday, but the fact that the parents could be doing different things, there's probably more going on there, but that's part of it. None of them are Christian today. So from a practical standpoint, it is very spiritually dangerous to have what we call unequally yoked, though that's not the context of 2 Corinthians 6, but to have two spouses that are not in communion with each other, right? Like we have problems with churches not in communion. Now you have two spouses that aren't. Um, so if you want worldly advice, of course, be convert to Roman Catholicism and your kids will be happy Roman Catholics. But here is the problem to that practical response to that question, which would be, if there's no salvation outside the church, schism's a sin, like it talks about in Galatians chapter five, then you might not be saving anyone's souls doing that either, right? Maybe you could say to your husband, I'm Protestant, you're Roman Catholic, orthodoxy's in the middle. That's not really true. But you can say, well, this is in the middle. How about we all do this? And then we two orthodox hope, a host are happy. Um, here's the real answer to your question, and it's not an easy one, which is, I think both you and your husband should fast together. You should follow the Wednesday, Friday fast. You should follow a prayer rule together, pray together. And your kids until they're like teenagers aren't gonna understand any doctrinal differences. Read the scriptures together. The doctrinal differences are not gonna come up in family worship and family reading, okay? Like you'd have to have rocket scientist kids for that to be an issue at that point. And um, so that being said, Bring this to God to give you wisdom, to give you humility, and to and pray explicitly about this issue. Yeah. And say, God, I'm sinful. I don't know the truth. I could be deceived. Have us worship according to what is your will. Have us worship in truth. Have us worship, you know, in the right church if we're not already in that church. It's so easy for a Protestant to leave a Protestant sect. Because Protestants are all in schism anyway. They, they, they yeah. don't pretend to be the church. So it'd be very easy to convert to Roman Catholicism, I think, for that reason. Um, however, this is still, even us Orthodox, right? Mm -hmm. We figured it out. Well, not really. We still actually have to have this sort of part, this sort of thing in our prayer life. So like, uh, so I pray every morning for the for that sort of wisdom. But anyway, because I want to worship God in truth and know that I'm a sinful man. So ultimately, the practical answer is yes, convert. But this is something that you must pray about and fast about and seek the Lord for. And, and God will provide because, right, uh, terrible parents still give gifts to their children. So how much more is our Heavenly Father going to provide for us when we, we take these things to prayer? So we'll take one more audience question in the meantime, and then we'll move forward. Um, to uh, another prepared topic. Someone was joking, I don't trust this guy. He doesn't have a beard. He's a real Greek, so he I doesn't try, have- I try, I try, I try. <laughs> he's a young man, he got married young. The, um, no, it's, he's a real Greek, yeah. so he doesn't have this chip on his shoulder where he has to grow a beard. I usually don't have a beard. So ever since COVID, we wear a face mask, so it kind of mm -hmm. takes away the need to shave. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> so I have this thing. But it will be shaved. Just I don't, tried don't you to worry. have a beard once, and a child come to me and said, "You look like a goat." So I stopped. <laughs> there you go. It's, yeah. uh, we got a question from a caddy command. I saw him making fun of my hat as usual. Um, mm. I will have a decovidized fedora in my house eventually, and then I'll I'll go back to the fedora. Um, Winter Rose asked, "This might be a heavy question, but is it theologically correct to call the Theotoko sinless?" There seems to be differing orthodox opinions on this. I know she's <laughs> yeah. accurate, most holy, but some say she was blameless, not sinless, which is reserved for Christ. Any clarification would be helpful. I asked this question to a nun in Greece, and she said, when we say she's sinless, we don't mean she's sinless in the same sense that Christ is sin sinless. I mean, you can say that... Uh, this water comes from the fountain you you're not saying it's the you are not using the word fountain there at the same sense when you say christ is the fountain so i mean 
she's sinless because our uh, our liturgical life and our um, yeah say, says this basically but uh, you know i think john chrysostom didn't have hold this view but again we are looking at the consensus of the what the fathers say not uh, what all agree exactly upon it's the consensus we're looking at because there can always be uh, a dissenting view but yes I think she is sinless, and I think the Orthodox Church teaches that, uh, actually. Yeah. No, yeah, it's, we have in our liturgy that Jesus Christ, the only sinless one. So yeah. there is this sort of sense that he's the only one without sin, but yeah. also the Theta goes, never committed sin. She never even, if we want to take it to its literal extent, contemplated sin. There seem to be moments, according to the fathers, where she could have bumbled into it and then the grace of Christ prevented her, um, which obviously great Christ and Adam before the fall didn't require that. So here's the simple answer to that question, which would be that Theotokos had original sin, but she didn't act upon it whatsoever. She still died because of original sin. She still had a turn from every passion, every erring thought because she had original sin. Um, but she was um, sinless as since she did commit sin. But also there's a sense where you could call the Theotokos sinful. Now, I don't like saying that, but actually you could quote St. Augustine, St. Fulgentius of Rups. They use that exact word, right? Um, St. Cyril of Jerusalem spoke the Theotokos um, as defiling, um, the term defile Jesus Christ. Now, we don't want to use these terms to the logical extent. We're not Protestants, nor are we Roman Catholics where we take a term and then we extrapolate doctrine because if the term means this, then that means that. That's not how we do theology and orthodoxy. The, the tradition of the church is clear that the Theotokos committed no sin. She's all holy, but she had original sin. In fact, just to kind of settle it, St. Augustine, St. Fulgentius of Rups literally used the term conceived in sin. So literally contradicts the later Roman Catholic doctrine of not being conceived in sin. Um, but it gets more to baptismal theology when you realize, okay, well, what's it mean to never commit sin, um, but then somehow be sinful? Right? How could he be sinless and sinful? And um, I'm going to read this really quick because we actually have a conciliar statement from the Orthodox Church on this exact issue. Um, and I just say this because there is this misinformation for Roman Catholics that the Orthodox teaching of the saints, because I could list saints that teach this, of Russians, of, yeah. it just doesn't mean, you know, you're American. We have someone here yeah. who's from Greece, from Elada. Right, who is saying that the same teaching is among the Greeks. This is mainstream Orthodox teaching, but there's this lie that, oh, this is something that Protestant converts bring into Orthodoxy, which is, again, just it's stupidity. Um, and I'm trying to get the right decree of the Council of Jerusalem 1672, and I'm going to share screen um, one second because I am not Mr. Technology, unlike John here. Right, John? Aren't you Mr. Technology? No. <laughs> what do you mean, no? <laughs> no, no? So anyway, yeah. Decree 6 of the Council of Decithia, so we of Jerusalem, which is Confession of Decithia, this was actually, um, this is a conciliar document, so we have this treated. We believe the first man created by God to have fallen in paradise. When disregarding the divine commandment, he yielded to the deceitful counsel of the serpent. And as a result, hereditary sin flowed to his posterity, right? So that everyone who's born out of the flesh bears this burden. Everyone born out of the flesh, meaning from sex, and experiences the fruits of it in this present world. But by these fruits and this burden, we do not understand actual sin, such as impiety, blasphemy, etc. Um, whatever else is by our depraved choice committed contrarily to the divine will, not from nature. For many, both of the forefathers and of the prophets and vast numbers of others, as well as those under the shadow of the law, as well as under the truth of the gospel, such as the divine precursor, so that's John the Baptist, and especially the mother of God of the word. So that's the Theotokos, the Virgin Mary, did not experience these sins or such like faults, but only what the divine justice inflicted upon man as a punishment for the original transgression such as sweats and labor, afflictions, bodily sickness, pains and childbearing, finally, while on our pilgrimage 
who live a laborious life and lastly bodily death. So not my opinion, right there in an orthodox document flat out says that, that the Theotokos had original sin, but she did not will acts of sin. Now, this is not the right show. I will have a show on this topic uploaded on this channel for people that want more details. Um, but long story short, this is a settled issue in orthodoxy that they took us at original sin. But what does it mean? Uh, uh, can you explain? Maybe the, she, the, maybe a Catholic thinks uh, she had the guilt. You know the guilt. What does an orthodox mean with original sin? Well, okay. Again, that's a whole other episode. But yeah, oh, sorry. <laughs> but if but in short, <laughs> original sin means that you are cut off by the divinizing, vivifying grace of God due to the existence of nomic willing, or to use the Western term, concupiscence. And so this wearing, this where, I can't use the right word in English, this propensity to turn from God and so that you always have to repent and set your mind all right, that's not the state of man before the fall. Well, having yeah. that state leads to not only our moral corruption, it leads to our physical corruption and death. They're joined together. However, just like that decree states, what we have not lost is the image of God, right? So unlike the Calvinist heresy of total depravity, we are capable of doing good according to nature. That's not Pelagianism. We have not lost the image of God and man. So we can do what is right. That's not the issue. So when we sin, it's our fault. It's not, you know, it's not the original sin's fault that you sinned. That's why like James chapter one says, God tempts no one to evil. You sin according to your own desire. But the existence of that desire is from original sin. So your free will choosing sin is your fault, but the, I would say the cloudiness of mind, that gnomic willing that allows us and encourages us to sin, that comes from original sin and so does death. Yeah. Roman Catholicism doesn't understand nomic will. So even when they have dropped ancestral death from their definition of original sin, their view still doesn't make sense. I'm going to have to do a whole episode on this. I just wrote a 7,000 uh, word article, page article, that's impossible. A 7,000 word article on exactly this topic that covers the entire conciliar teaching of the Orthodox Church and every single council on original sin. And this topic um, will be, hopefully, it's going to be in a mainstream Orthodox source from an official jurisdiction. So that's why I'm not going to go out with it yet, but I will do a show on it. And the Council of Dissentheus, I have a show that will be uploaded on this channel sometime, I don't know, today or tomorrow. And I cover this in a little more detail. It's so, yeah, I think it's important that my teacher says it uh, at one point that we, we remember also that sometimes we say you know oh he sinned because he's human but no he sins because he's falling in short of his humanity god did not create a nature a, a sin is something foreign to the human to the nature so uh, i think this is important to say because these questions can have a underlying actually um i don't want to be hard as a heretical view but you know that we say that to sin is a human thing. You know, in our experience, you know, all humans sin. But theologically speaking, sin is something uh, foreign to the nature. So you cannot on a principle level say she cannot have been sinless on a human level. She can never be sinless. Nobody can be sinless on the, you know, as God is sinless, you know. But on a principle level, we should not say that she could not have sinned because she is human, because th this then suggests that God created man to sin. Because everything that we put in the nature, you know, everything we say this belongs to the nature, is from God. Uh, you know, and then we and take that with everything Craig said. Uh, you know that we have fallen, and there is effect of the fall that that we need to get baptized for. Uh, you know, th that's why we have a baptism. So yeah, that's my my little input. Uh, to your uh, very good uh, response, I think. Yeah, but it, it's a so, very. And yeah. I'm just going to add, my Lutheran brother could even get this right. It, it, he flat out says, Theotokos was perhaps a sinless vessel indeed in thought, but was bound to original sin as she was human. Uh, she 
Jesus Bros and Vinny, but that's pro talk. He's talking about 1984. So anyway, I'm going to stop sharing my brother because he doesn't know I'm sharing <laughs> his Facebook yeah. message. But the point is, this is not a complicated concept. My brother's not theologically inclined, which is why I never, I have a twin brother. Imagine two of me on the show at the same time. But it's, uh, so point is, this is simple stuff that people confuse, but it's because we're not talking about orthodoxy. We're too often talking about the doctrine of schismatics and, and not our actual doctrines. So this is one of your topics, which we'll cover quickly because we're already at an hour. <laughs> death and resurrection. So what's in your mind about death and resurrection, John? I don't know. Um, I'm thinking of, you know, that the resurrection could be, um, we live in a world, you know, we have the COVID, we have different things that are going on, and death is reminding us uh, again and again that we are, we are going to die, everybody, you know. And uh, this, is, this is something hard. This is something many people are struggling with. And, uh, but we have the resurrection and uh, this hope united with Christ, we, we could have this hope. I think this is something the world needs to hear, uh, that we not only point out what's wrong with the world, but actually gives the solution. And I think the solution is, no, I don't think. When I say I think, I'm speaking in a Swedish way. We always speak vaguely, but we, I mean, the solution is Christ uh, and his resurrection. And I think someone said that outside of the resurrection of Christ, there is no hope for, for mankind. Uh, so, yeah, that's my initial thoughts. Yeah, I just, I just add a death and resurrection is, one, we're spiritually dead apart from the grace of God. You look at the icon of the heroine of Hades, and you see Jesus grabbing Adam and Eve, and he's grabbing them by their wrists. Because they it's not according to their own power that they can live the resurrected life. It's totally the grace of Christ that does this, and we see that in that icon. Um we also have to have constantly death before us. So we have to think about how we live in our lives, um, whether or not we're dying onto ourselves, our own desires and living onto Christ, because that's what our eternity is. And if we don't start repenting and changing our will to have a resurrected will, a, a Christocentric will, if we don't have that, we're going to have a will around death and we will carry that with us for eternity. So Christ has saved us. And by faith in him, we now enter to, the grace of God that enables us to live the resurrected life, which will be an eternity in heaven if we shall so persevere in that faith and grow in sanctification. So it's uh, it's an important topic, and I think it's a little – it gets much deeper than that, but I think if we get any deeper than that, uh, people may not um, – it might get beyond that. So here's an important one, um, icons. And I'm going to change this thing as we're talking about icons. Um, do they have icons of the Father in Greece, by the way? You know, God the Father. Is that a Russian thing? I think John froze. You, you see how John is doing this and he looks super serious? I think he froze. And so as John figures out what's going wrong, <laughs> I'm going to talk about the issue of icons and tell him that you froze the light but go back in. Now, the issue with icons is, like, I have to answer the question. I've seen um, – and look, John's back. Yeah. I, John, I, you're back. I went to the Hades and, uh, yeah, that. <laughs> I, you know, I, I'm guessing that your country is very backward. You're barely on the internet. You're on a 56K mode. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> You know, in my wife's country, though, they still have internet cafes. That's how backward they are there. I'm sure Greece is yeah. very much totally normal. Yeah. But yeah. Um, icons of the Father, there's a canon in the Russian church against it. Um, I believe just plainly taking the theology of St. John of Damascus and the fourth book, Exposition of the Orthodox Faith, um, we can have icons of the Father. Um, I've had Father John Whiteford on the show. He disagrees. Um, in Greece, are there a lot of icons of the Father, or is that just a Russian thing? I have seen it, but uh, my theological uh, view is that it is uncanonical. I mean, um, but sometimes, sometimes uh, there is Christ with a white beard, and uh, he can be. You can think it, it's the Father, but it's not actually the Father. It's 
it's Christ, you know. The, yeah, because those who have seen me seen the Father. Um, yeah, something like that. But uh, And also in Revelation, he, he has white hair, hair like wool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So some tries to depict that. But um, I think the Seven Ecumenical Council said you should not um, depict the Father, I think. So I have uh, not... Uh, so, I mean, if I'm correct... I actually don't that. remember that in the Seventh Ecumenical Council. They actually have depictions of the Holy Spirit as literal yeah. dove statues in the Seventh Ecumenical Council. It's mentioned a couple yeah. of times. Yeah. But it's kind of mentioned yeah. negatively, by the way. They don't have... They don't disallow for statuary, but they kind of mention it somewhat negatively. In the so, I mean, yeah, so wh why I'm saying this, because the whole theological... Um, view why we can depict Christ is because of his incarnation and the first person of the Trinity, the apostasy, the father, David, never. Um, so, I mean, so I think that is the view, but uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know everything, so. Well, in Greece, during COVID, they stopping you, are they stopping you guys from kissing the icons? They can't. They, so <laughs> Greeks, are, the, they're, they're not paying attention you know. to it. They're kissing their icons. Let me, I mean, some don't. I see they're bowing and stopping exactly. But I, I was thinking I was going to do that. Uh, you know, we were kissing the icons at home. But when I came to the church, I was like, okay, let me just die then. <laughs> so I'll just kiss them, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it's rational, but I felt, you know, it was, you know. It, yeah, but, I, uh, yeah. my friends from Romania, um, he was kissing icons for a man. He said, no one's paying attention to the lockdowns there. It's like pretty much just the patriarch had to toe the line and everyone else ignores it. Yeah. And if it's tough in your area, you always yeah. go to the monastery and they're definitely ignoring it. Um, yeah. The Serbians yeah. apparently yeah. have zero limits on it whatsoever. Um, yeah. And that's true. Um, you know, so, so it seems like only Americans and it seems like Western converts, the only ones actually listening to their bishops on this. And I'll tell you why. Because one, sadly, most of the bishops that are ta talking about this are wrong. Bishops could be wrong. I'm not telling you to be disobedient, but they could be wrong. They're fallible men. And yeah. you can't take a society where they've been doing this for 1,000 to 2,000 years and then make them, we're not going to do this because of some disease. Like, we've been doing this through every disease that's ever existed yeah. for the last 2,000 exactly. years. This is not going to change. Yeah. yeah. But it's here's the reason why we shouldn't be afraid to venerate mm -hmm. an icon. Not because you can't get sick ever or whatever, because God can make you get sick, breathing the air in the church, walk into your car. There's so many ways you could get sick. The reason we should venerate icons is because when you venerate the type, the icon, it passes on to the prototype. When I venerate this icon, Jesus Christ is actually venerated. Dulia, all right? Service is actually paid to Christ. Yeah. Service is actually paid to the Theotokos. Who's more powerful, the virus or the prayers of the mother of God, our chief intercessor for us, for, uh, between us and God? Obviously, the prayers of the Theotokos. So there should be no fear in um, venerating the icons unless you just have a very bad prayer life and you don't trust God to answer your prayers. And if that's the case, if that's the case, it actually says in James chapter 1 that those who pray with doubt will not have their prayers answered. All right. And so if that's the case, then you probably shouldn't venerate the icons. You know, I'm, I'm going to go look up the actual passage in James chapter one, because if, the, if that's the case, then don't. If you don't think God's going to answer your prayers, <laughs> don't do it because <laughs> he's not going to. Um, just looking up the word doubt real quick. He says, if verse five and six, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God who gives to all liberally and without reproach, it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he'll receive anything from the Lord if he's a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. So there you go. If you don't think venerating the Theotokos is going to help you in a time of disease, you don't need her prayers in a time of plague, then don't, because God ain't going to answer your prayers if you, if you, if you don't have faith. If you have faith, God will answer your prayers. And that does not mean, though, that God will not permit you to endure suffering, right? In fact, we believe God, uh, he disciplines those that he loves. So, yes, suffering will come our way, and he draws us closer to him. 
But um, so anyway, that's my opinion on the issue of icons. I've had whole shows on COVIDianism even before it became a big deal um, about the veneration of icons. So uh, people could go more into that topic on the channel if they want. And I am, as I'm trying to get our next topic up, I will put this up for you because you're somewhat local. What's your opinion on the Macedonian church, John? You smiled. Yeah, because, you know, here they don't like that Macedonia calls itself Macedonia. And even people from Macedonia and Greece don't dare to say Macedonia about their own country. <laughs> yeah. No, so mean, it's, a fake, it's a fake country name? No, it has the name um, Skopje, the capital uh, Skopje. Because Macedonia, okay, it's, it's a big story, but Alexander the Great is important for the Greek uh, self-identification. Alexander the Great played, uh, um, had a big role in that, uh, especially after, yeah, well, we don't need to get it. Um, but, I mean, what is my view? I actually had some, um, I had some friends from the Macedonian church, both one, one, both one in my class. And uh, also when I lived in Italy two months, there was a Macedonian church there and I knew I was, I went to his home and we ate dinner. Uh, he cooked moussaka, very good. And they're, I think they are nice people. We're about to and, talk about favorite food. <laughs> yeah. It's important to remember here that this schism in Macedonia, if I remember it correctly, it's a political invasion. You know, there are politics that created this schism. And I really hope we can be united. I think. Uh, yeah, I'm not aware of some dogmatic difference. It's only almost politics, and uh, so that's 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 yeah, bad. I mean, no... we have 100. I think we have 100 abortion in Greeks every year, and people are more upset about a country using a specific name. I don't know if that's from Christ. So yeah, it's. I feel two ways about this. I'll add a full disclosure. I live in the city of Syracuse. We actually have a Macedonian church. So they're not in, they're not communion with our other Orthodox churches, which yeah. is a shame, right? And, and for now also the Rokor church is in communion with the Greek church. Yeah. And so we have this, but the Macedonian schism occurred because of a good old Tito of Yugoslavia. Yeah. And so they didn't want to have a church that was not in, at that time, I think Macedonia, the country, was not part of Serbia, was not part of Greece, but I weren't in the Eastern Bloc. So they did not want a country, a church, um, which was a buffer between Greece and the Eastern Bloc. They didn't want them to be in communion with the Serbian church, which was totally under the thumb of the communists um, in a bad way. Like the church in Albania almost disappeared because of the communists. They almost ran out of priests, and they didn't have a bishop for bishops for a long period of time. I think, so it's it was a terrible situation. So when you look at the politics, it's not really all that strange that a schism occurred. What's what's strange? It hasn't been healed since the Cold War, and mostly it's because Serbia wants to continue to have jurisdiction over them, and Bulgaria, which is again my patriarchy. Bulgaria almost entered communion with the Macedonians, which would have brought them into world Orthodox communion until the Serbians put their foot down and said, no, you're invading our canonical territory. Um, ultimately, it's a heresy to think that if you're ex-ethnic group, you should have your own church. So, right, I shouldn't feel bad as an American that I'm under the Bulgarian patriarchate. You shouldn't feel bad if you're Ukrainian to be under a Russian or whatever. But... People should stop being so greedy. If people are going to be fighting over the stupid stuff and language or whatnot, I think they should just let them be. So that's my opinion, but it doesn't justify schism. Um, a thing we should also remember is almost every church that had autocephaly um, lost it due to the Turks putting them into communion with Constantinople. And as the Turks lost ground, even in Greece, they left, made their own patriarchate separate from Constantinople. Yeah, All right. So, yeah. yeah, so what happened with the Macedonians, like kind of splitting off, waiting to eventually get their autocephaly, that's not so strange. That happens with everyone else. Why can't it happen with them? So it's sort of unfair. 
if, if you look at it that way. So it's selfish that they're doing it and it's unfair that they're not letting them do it. So they're kind of both wrong in that sense. That's, that's my opinion. Um, so you're talking about food. What's your favorite fast food? Nice. During a fast, what's your favorite thing to eat? So we have a soup here in Greece and it's uh, with beans, uh, faki it's called. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I think it's very good. Um, I mean, if you're really hungry, I mean, bread <laughs> is doing fine. <laughs> no, but yeah, uh, there are different soups that are good, but I like avocado. Uh, I think it's, uh, yeah, serving the purpose. Uh, yeah, but the whole point is not the foods during the fast. So, I mean, <laughs> you, you just yeah. said it all. I'll just add that's exactly the problem because you can yeah. eat um, baking chocolate chips that are for baking and they're chocolate and they're, they've they got no anything that's against the fast in those chocolate chips. You can eat lollipops, yeah. um, you can now have imitation meat. Yeah, we should be eating less during the fast and hopefully less expensively so then we could give more alms. But the problem exactly. is crap junk food is cheaper than fast food now. The healthy food's more expensive. That's how we know we're in the end times. It's like, right, <laughs> for me to actually fast is like for me to have bread, which is three bucks, is more yeah. expensive than to get a, you know, a yodel or a ding dong from Drake's Cakes, you know, with cream yeah. and all that stuff in it. You know, for me to get a pound and of meat is less. And the stuff are good, yeah. If you yeah, like for me to have a pound of beef is cheaper than for me to have a pound of spinach. So, so it's like, am I fasting by going to McDonald's now? It's, it's become different. Not really because McDonald's has become expensive. But it's, um, my point is, it's, it's, we need to have the spirit of the fast. And it's okay if you go, what do I like? I like falafel. Um, falafel yeah. is really yeah. tasty. I love shrimp. I'm one of those orthodox that eat shrimp even when I'm not fasting. And someone will say, well, why are you eating shrimp? It's not a fast day. Because I like shrimp. Why? Yeah. <laughs> right? Like, yeah. why can't I eat what I like? Like, do I stop eating salad when it's not a fast day? So yeah. it's funny. My wife would never eat steak. And when I actually became orthodox, now she'll eat plain steak. So it's almost <laughs> like it shows you sin, how, in, how, how insidious it is, right? Like, it'll make you want beef more than you yeah, used to. Yeah, every Tuesday you're eating, like, the, a pig alive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's... Exactly. Like I'm just looking forward to like eating ice cream or something when like otherwise it would have been take it or leave it. So yeah. what's your opinion on good old Jordan Peterson? I don't even think he's actually a Christian, right? He, he just kind of likes Christian. some orthodox yeah. stuff. Yeah. I mean, so I don't know he... a lot about him. I know he's like a philosopher. So you, you tell us about Jordan Peterson and maybe why we should be careful with what, uh, with his stuff. Yeah. Okay, we need to have two different categories, orthodox and non-orthodox. I'm sorry. <laughs> if he was orthodox and saying the things he was saying, he would be a heretic. <laughs> mm -hmm. If we put him in the world, then we can say, wow, this man has actually some wisdom. <laughs> yeah. So that, that's, that's basically my take. Yeah. yeah. And I, th I think that's a, a good take to appreciate where it's coming from someone who is not orthodox. Um, we have a question from Evgeny. Um, does Reformation theology understand and accept the Eastern view of Christ redeeming human nature? If yes, how is that compatible with total depravity or bondage of the will? Um, have you studied this at all, John? I know you've taken some courses on the Protestant stuff. Uh, let me read this one more time. Do, do, do. I'll say this while John is reading. I've never heard it as a Protestant, so I don't think they've really interacted with it, which is why even the Eucharistic theology doesn't believe the Eucharist has Christ's um, human and divine nature, even though, for example, they both Calvinists and Lutherans believe in the real presence of Christ, but because I don't think they really understand what it means that he became man, they don't impose that in the rest of their theology. Um, so I think we covered some of this when we talked about dec the decree and the Council of Decipia. So that'd be my comments. What are yours, John? Yeah, I mean, it depends on what sh was it a she uh, means on the redeeming of the human nature. Uh, we Orthodox don't think the human nature was um, irredeemably, you know, fallen. Uh, we believe we speak more of the effects of the fall. 
than the actual that so that's a big difference and um so so what does he mean if the what the protestants thinks about our view of that yeah or, do they believe that christ redeemed human nature when he became man and i would say no yeah. i think they're just obsessed with debt he paid a penalty on the cross he gave god the 50 bucks god was owed god the father yeah. that is that's right? like, yeah. so this i i think it's like you don't even really see a lot of that roman catholicism this idea that because christ became man that means even that those who um and he died and he resurrected that means even the damned will resurrect in human bodies like it, like people don't get that right there's a uh, sense in which he saved the damned because now they've resurrected human bodies because he has yeah. he has fundamentally changed human nature which was yeah. not completely lost at adam but then became prone to cor moral corruption and corruption and death yeah. right and so I just don't, I think because Protestantism is a schism, a schism, it's so far removed. None of that even makes sense anymore within the paradigm of Protestantism. Yeah, I, I think it's important that the fathers, they were friends of God, you know, they knew God as their father. So, you know, what does the God think? Well, he's our father and he loves us. So when the Calvinists say that, you know, some people are created in, so God can send them to hell uh, and they have no cho choice. Well, there are so many problems with that. I don't know where to begin. First of all, you're saying that God is the cause of evil. Second of all, that's like the worst racism you can say. I mean, a racist condemns a, a person's, you know, skin color. But you're not condemning only the skin color. You're condemning everything with that person. The nature, the hypostasis, his thoughts, everything. Uh, this is not a, a, a church father can never have this, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, the consensus of the fathers will never reach this, um, this point. And, and it, it's, I mean, I know Calvinists and they seem they're nice people. So I'm not really condemning their intent. But their theology is very, I mean, it creates atheists. I, I, I don't, the, the Orthodox Church is very, very far away from this view. And I mean, we can discuss Romans 9, 10, 11, wherever you want. It doesn't say what they say, uh, I promise you. So it's, uh, you know, yeah. We, could, mean, do you, a, we I, could do a show of that actually. Yeah, yeah, sure. The, um, and we actually have a Protestant who's interested in doing that show as well. I, I just did a study of all Romans 9 from the fathers. So it's kind of fresh in my mind. So Kanye West, you care about Kanye West and Greece? I didn't, like, I barely <laughs> care about him here. I was surprised I you brought this yeah. up. Yeah. I mean, does anyone talk about Kanye in, in Greece? No, I just saw, you know, some of uh, uh, Jonathan Pajot's uh, video. He likes him, kind of. And I wanted to hear your thoughts, actually, of what, what you know. I'm seriously. I mean, from here, it seems like, you know, a joke a little bit, maybe. So I I'm know. seriously contemplating voting for him because I live in New York and my vote doesn't matter even in a fair election. <laughs> it, always, it always goes Democrat and Electoral College. All New York's votes yeah. will, will go that way. Um, I think it's good whether he has correct and intent or not that he's at least yeah. speaking up more about christian things in a weird way him being a born-again protestant takes him further away from the truth because his wife is a armenian orthodox and their children are baptized armenian orthodox so like he's actually going a little further away from orthodox he's not like he started attending liturgy at the armenian orthodox church more often then we could be a little happier about that um personally i think him candace owens i think a a, a lot of there's money to be made right now for black entertainers to pretend they're conservative because it now helps them get a bunch of Trumpskis to buy their albums or listen to their shows. I don't know how, how authentically they really believe it. So I think to Kanye, it's all a joke. Um, you know, and I, I've thought this back since 2005 when during Hurricane Katrina, he said live on TV when no one spoke this way about a president. He said, George Bush doesn't care about black people. And right next to him was Austin Powers himself, uh, whoever the real actor's name is, I can't remember. And he was surprised he said this live during a charity event, right? And so 
it's I just think Kanye says and does things to wow people and to surprise them. I don't know. I don't think any of it's authentic, and I have no interest in listening to his music. <laughs> but power to him. He's doing more positive than negative. So I'm not saying that to be to beat up on yeah. him, right? He's talking yeah. against abortion. So enemy, yeah, I think, enemies yeah. I don't think everything is dishonest. I think some actually is. And I saw on his Twitter sometime uh, some days ago, he put like you know orthodox icons like like 20 of them so i mean yeah i i can't i can't judge his heart really but i you know it's it's an entertainer you know and so entertainers can entertain so we got a quick comment here i am a non-denomination my parents ethiopian orthodox why is the reason the orthodox church puts mary so highly if we biblically should not pray to her or talk to her that's an idol um john can i'll I, let you answer that question and i yeah thank you for the question I mean, uh, where does the Bible say you should not pray to Mary? That's my first question. The second, it actually says the opposite. You know, every nation will, uh, what say, pray, praise me. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, so that's the third. And the, uh, the second and the third is, I mean, you're really saying that the mother of God is an idol. I mean... It's good when we see an idol to say that's an idol, but it's really bad to point to the apostles or to the mother of God and say, oh, that's an idol too. I mean, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's not good. You're, you're, yeah. Well, I don't know. Is, if you ask your parents for prayer, is that idolatry? So why is asking Christ's mother for prayer yeah. idolatry? She also, oh, oh, well, she can't yeah. really hear prayer. Well, how do you know that? You know, so, um, what's his name? Elisha was able to know what what's his name was up to when he was far away. He had clairvoyance. So the saints in heaven don't have clairvoyance, but the saints on earth could have clairvoyance. So Mary can't hear your. It doesn't make any sense. Oh, she doesn't have enough time to. She exists outside of space time continuum. Time does not exist. Space does not exist. So right, every counter argument is just based on human reason. It actually doesn't make any sense. It's um, not biblical. It's not biblical. The same person say that the devil is everywhere. How is that? He's not God. He's also bounded by space and time. The space. He just uh, can move very fast. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> how, how is the? How is the? You know? How is it? I mean, the, the same people say, "Oh, I prayed for you know something, and then this person come and had the solution." How did that happen? Well, the, God is everywhere, and if God is in me. And God is in this person. This can, this is the connection. I mean, from a, you can say it in that way, but I mean. But yeah, I don't want to be mean to um to no, our question here. Question. Yeah, it's a good question. You know, question. it's it's just I, I I guess I want to answer it for that way for that reason. For an Orthodox Christian, it's so eminently biblical and so ingrained in our tradition. It doesn't make sense to be against it. It only makes sense within the Protestant tradition. So what you're saying is sensible according to your tradition. If you take tradition away and just look at the Bible, you see that the saints pray in Revelation chapter 6. We see that the saints have clairvoyance. Any reason to believe that the saints can't receive and give prayers to God, where in chapter 8 of Revelation it says that the prayer of the saints as incense was given to God. Every reason to go against the Orthodox doctrine biblically doesn't make sense because the Orthodox doctrine is explicitly in the Bible. So we have Emil saying, why are modern Orthodox so adamant on denying inherited guilt when this is clear precedent for it in our catechisms? And he's citing question 24, St. Peter Mobilo's catechism. Um, I'll just answer, Emil, um, I actually speak specifically on that catechism as well as other sources in an upcoming article that I have. I'll just say very quickly that we inherit death, the penalty of death, um, but what we don't inherit is the actual guilt of the infraction. And, the, and it's important to bring it up because we don't believe God arbitrarily punished us as a result of infraction. You would, none of the saints teach that. Um, so meaning, well, technically, if you just take them at face value, just martyr seems to say something like that. So I'll walk that back. But if you look at St. Gregory and so St. Maximus, saints that get into more detail, they will say that the reason why we die is because Adam and Eve stopped abiding in God's energy and God's life. So disobedience is the willful cutting off 
of our cooperation of our will, the divine will. And when that happens, that's like breaking an electrical circuit. You're no longer energized by God in the same way and you will die. So that we did inherit from Adam and Eve. But what we did inherit was death as a penalty or concupiscence as a penalty. Because God is not the author of evil. That's in decree one, if I remember right, of the confession of Dositheus. God is not the author of evil. So God didn't say, and also wisdom 113 says that God did not create death, right? So God did not as, oh, you did something bad, Adam. So now you're going to die as a punishment. And everyone after you that's born in you is going to die as a punishment in the strict sense of you did something bad. Now I make this new thing. No, Adam and Eve were already fallen before God pronounces curses in Genesis chapter three. The moment their will stopped co cooperating with God's will, the fall had already taken place. That's what the fall is. And so original sin is our continuance in what had occurred since the fall, which we do because of our gnomic willing. So um, again, yeah, it seems like people want this whole episode of original sin. We will have it. Um, but inherited guilt doesn't mean what you think it is. And that's why the West is wrong. It's God it, it explicitly contradicts wisdom chapter one. God does not impose any evil upon man. Man opposes, opposes it upon himself and deals with the, consequence, the consequences of it. Um, that's my comments, yeah. John. Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't actually catch the question. Uh, I think, uh, or uh, did he mean that uh, we're not guilty in the sense of, you know, that I am responsible for Adam's sin? Uh, that's not uh, that's not an orthodox uh, position, but uh, uh, so yeah. But I, I have actually just studied uh, quite a lot, uh, not quite a lot, uh, kind of a lot. Uh, the councils uh, during this period and this um, homologies, how do you say it in English? The um, um, confessions? No. Uh, anyway. And we need to remember also the what sometimes these councils also during in uh, uh, Jerusalem and uh, and uh, and others they're really fighting. We need to need to see also what they are trying to respond to. Sometimes they are responding to something Protestant, uh, and uh, at this point, you know, they didn't have internet like we do and all the sources. It, it was not so easy to find, you know. Uh, everything and uh, Greece was under the Ottoman Empire and it was difficult. So sometimes they are also used some uh, some saints used some Catholic resources, some used some Protestant resources too. Uh, so when an uh, Orthodox saint was trying to, let's say, combat and Protestant, sometimes he used, I can give many examples, but uh, uh, some Catholic resources. And at some, le at some point he, he could have uh, adopted some of the Catholic influences. So, I mean, we had this discussion uh, last week in the class and uh, our, our person in the class said, but how, how, how is this possible? And the teacher said, but we need to see what, what they had at the hand at that time. So uh, I, I'm, not say, I'm not saying that this applies to the quote you gave, but we need to also to think that we need to look at the whole church. What has the fathers teach everywhere? at all councils, at all places, and we are not looking at what the fathers, everyone individually has said exactly. We're, no, we're looking at the consensus. So we don't have, the, um, yeah. So that's some, yeah. I'm not sure why I said it because I don't say it as a response to this question really. I'm saying that uh, that we, we, can't, we can't use the councils or the fathers in a Protestant way, you know, that we take a verse and not regarding what what uh, the the context of this verse, because if you do, if you don't do that, the Bible will contradict itself and the councils will contradict themselves. We need to see what is the context, what's it trying to respond. Is some Catholic language is used here because they're responding to some Protestant or not? So, but the clear theology of the church, this I'm sure of, is that we are not inherited the guilt of Adam. That's not orthodox. We, we, everything Craig, to be honest, I think Craig knows more about me than this. Uh, so, 
So I will not, but on that level, I know so much. And then I think Craig knows more about the details, what exactly it means to be fallen. So I will not speak of that. Yeah, Augustine, just so people know, literally did believe you were guilty of like, let's say yeah. your father, yeah. I don't know, I'll yeah, make exactly. a minor sin, ate a beef sandwich on a Friday, right? Yeah. You would inherit that guilt because your soul came from your father. And yeah. so that is something that inherited guilt entails and in that you would actually, you are just as guilty as picking that apple and eating it as Adam was. And so it sounds stupid, but it's not because it's actually philosophically consistent. And the scriptures speak of being in the loins of, uh, of I forget who, Judah being the loins of Abraham, no, Aaron being the loins of Abraham when he paid the tithe to Melchizedek. So the idea was, Augustine said, well, well, clearly, if you could pay the tithe when you're in someone else's loins, well, when you're in their loins, when they sin, you sin too. Yeah. So there's even a biblical logic to it. It's not retarded. Yeah. And if and it's called transducinianism. There's it's it's a philosophy from back when. It's not stupid, but it's not orthodox either. So yeah, it, I'm gonna... that's, that's the point. I mean, exactly like you said, Craig. There are, uh, you know, at some level, many saints are trying to figure things out. And it's easy for us now sitting back. We have the internet. We have the, all the sources. We have in Greek, you know, all the patristic, you know, uh, thousands of thousands of pages. And it's easy for us to, to read and see what the fathers say. But many fathers are in the, you know, in, in the field of trying to explain things and sometimes and it's the church that is infallible you know it's the church that says okay we don't say it exactly like this but we say it like this uh, so I mean so uh, yeah so it's so, logical but many things are logical it doesn't mean it's it's right from the church uh, perspective so I agree, give this I agree question with, I'm gonna give this question to you because yeah. I gotta get a power cord what would you say to someone? who denies physical resurrection and speaks only of a spiritual one and like Gnostics and other early Christian thoughts as well as maybe some wackos today. So what would your response to that be, John? And I'll be right back. Okay, uh, <clears throat> so well, the Bible speaks of a physical resurrection and we need to remember when we speak of the human nature, we are also speaking of the human body, you know, it's not, uh, so when we speak of the resurrection, uh, from a Christian perspective, it's nonsensical to speak of a spiritual uh, resurrection. Uh, so, uh, so, so Paul discusses at length in the in his epistles about the physical resurrection, and really, the Christian hope is the uh, the so uh, the whole humans human body and soul's resurrection, because. There were al already, you know, ideas of a spiritual resurrection. I mean, we we the we have um, a text from ancient Greek that speaks of the uh, that the soul is eternal and so on. So, but the unique Christian uh, perspective here is that also the physical world, the matter, is actually created of God and is transformed. So, going back a little bit to the question we had before about had, has Christ redeemed our nature and so on? Christ redeemed everything in the human, you know, he's redeeming everything in, in the incarnation. And you ask yourself this, if the soul was only the thing that needed to be resurrected with the spirit, why did Christ come here to have a body also? Uh, it seems like an unnecessary thing to do. Uh, so, uh, but yeah, if the, if it is a Christian that asks this question, the obvious answer is the scripture say, says it. I mean, you can't get around it. You really no, need to do some acrobatics to deny it. Uh, but if there is like a, and the other answer is that I said that we, we don't consider the matter being bad in itself. God created everything good and uh, so a human being is not only a spirit, uh, and you know it, right? You want, you need also in these COVID times, for example, you're not. It's it doesn't feel sufficient to be with yourself and talking to your uh, on the phone. You need also this human connection. 
so the human body is not only a, a soul it's also a spirit uh, about has a body yeah all right then it's people start arguing with each other in the chat and so while i'm looking for another question i think we'll go to our last prepared topic what, what are is, they arguing about <laughs> it's not stepping on ants um, the Agia Sophia, I mean, you're Greek, so like maybe that means more to you. <laughs> you know, it's a matter of pride. Um, what's what's the deal with this? Where do you think we're going in the future with it? Why is it important? It's Agia Sophia. Well, in here, in Thessaloniki, we already have Agia Sophia that is like 1,500 years old or something. Oh, that's pretty cool. Uh, that people don't know about, but... Yeah, my point was more like a joke almost that maybe we should build just a new church. You know, we are 300 million Orthodox and we could do it. <laughs> but yeah, so I mean, I mean, if the Muslims in Turkey really want to pray in our churches and, uh, <laughs> you know, um, maybe that will lead them to God. I have, I, I my father my mother said to my father once that she wanted to buy a alarm you know if it's if we have a fire or a thief comes in if alarm for a thief and he said uh, no we don't need it we have christ that protects us and my mother said but what if he takes all the icons uh, then he said then he will come back and uh, ask us for forgiveness because the icons will you know look at him all the day and he will repent so, but, you know, I mean, it's sad. It saddens the Greek people. Hagia Sophia is um, not only a symbol in a superficial sense. And uh, yeah, but I have a distant thing emotionally to it because I was born in Sweden. So I'm not, I don't have this Hagia Sophia in mind that, like that. We had one church and that was it in Sweden, in Stockholm. Yeah. Yeah, it's... Personally, it's to me not a big deal. Um, the church has been through worse. It was already a mosque. And, um, you know, I think what we're going through with abortion and whatnot is, and bishops telling people not to venerate icons is far worse than something that wasn't a church still not being a church. So, I mean, I think that's, one, that's my one, take on it. Yeah, I think you're right. One baby aborted, I think, is more precious than, I guess, Sophia forgot. Um, so, so we have uh, about that. I, passing comments about know. autocephaly where Emil Sirx has plenty of ancient canons that seem to support the ecumenical patriarch's authority to, to grant autocephaly. And then so it says, no, you need to have a tomos. Um, both are not wrong about different things. I'm just going to say this real quick. What has happened canonically has been what has been received from the church and what people allow. People don't get this, which is what utterly annoys me. Meaning the idea that like when a church was first granted autocephaly, there was no precedent for it. So how do we know it was real? Because everyone conceded to it and they all agreed. What the church agrees, bond consensus goes. You know, how is it that the ecumenical patriarch overtook in the canonical order Alexandria? Well, it's because the whole church agreed upon it, and then it goes. That happens in, the, I think, Canon 3, Constantinople 1, and Canon 28 of Chalcedon. All right? Um, so how do a lot of these, how did um, Cyprus gain its autonomy? Same thing. The church, they found the relics of Bar St. Barnabas, and then the church recognized, all right, we're going to accept what happened canonically in Chalcedon. That's at least the tradition. So the point is, there's nothing necessarily ahistorical about people going to schism and trying to have their own national churches and whatnot. And there's nothing wrong with people do accept it. And there's nothing wrong with people don't accept it. Right. What eventually people accept is what becomes the rule. People want it to be more mechanistic or something like Roman Catholicism, but that's just not historical. That's just not what we've seen since the beginning of the church. The idea that we even think about this, we're aligned to patriarchates along, along lines of Roman Empire provinces. Do you think the church before, like the 
maybe the third century really did it that way. No, it's something that took over because of convenience. It was easier to administer. Yeah. And then, exactly. and then is, and then especially when the Roman Empire started actually patronizing these churches. And so then they would only want one bishop in a province for that reason, because they're only going to give so much money to that province, and et cetera. So the point is, when the church accepts something, for example, being aligned jurisdictionally according to the provinces of the Roman Empire, you know, and then allowing bishops according to the metropolitans and lesser bishoprics along those lines, you know, if we could accept that, then we could accept Macedonia being a church, and we could also not accept it. What it doesn't do is give the ecumenical patriarch a magical, a magic wand, right? Like that's what people don't get. It's not like this means a magic wand that Ukraine could just become a church without other people accepting it, because actually that's what we don't see in church history, is that churches could act unilaterally. That's a really a neo-papism. That's what the Roman Catholic ecclesiology went into. So just something to point out, because people get to this argument, never ask themselves the basic question, under what jurisdictional lines were people in the second and third centuries? And was it always according to Roman province, or was it not? And how did it get under that? And is there something divinely inspired about Roman provinces, right? How about the provinces of the Persian Empire? It just get, it gets silly. And I just think people have to realize that consent means something in the church. So looking for a question as we go. And uh, wait, I think, can I have one here? Oh, it was Dr. Sophia. So, hey, we might be, we might be done soon. Um, you chose horror movies for some reason. What, what's that have to do with Orthodox Christianity, John? <laughs> Hello, I saw some videos some days ago that discussed can a Christian watch horror movies? So I want to hear your opinion about it. Someone asked me about Call of Duty. And I would say, technically, I don't think it's objectively sin, but so many things are subjectively sinful, meaning every time you're not loving God with all your heart, all your mind, and all your strength, you're sinning. I hate to break it to yeah. you, right? Yeah. <laughs> so that's why, like, yes, there's fast days and non-fast days, but like when you're gorging yourself in the non-fast day, you're not objectively sinning, but subjectively you are. And so we have to see horror movies, video games. Um, I saw The Nun, for example, which is a there's Roman Catholic nunnery in oh. Romania. It doesn't make any sense. It's, it's entertaining yeah. though, um, but I wouldn't yeah. consider it a godly activity. It's not as good as reading scriptures. And like, or watching this, and watching this isn't as good as giving alms or, or doing some other good work, you know? So we have to see these things on a scale would be, would be my point. And um, someone asked, how do you defend the concept of church and state within orthodoxy? I'll give you that one to you, John. Well, uh, I don't see any specific idea in that sentence, that question, Anthony, but it's a good question. And uh, what I have learned, at least in my studies, is that the, at least in the uh, Byzantine Empire, the idea was that there should be um, a, co a collaboration. Not the, the state doesn't go into the fields of the church, and the church doesn't go into the fields of the state. But I mean, if you think, I think it was a second ecumenical council that asked the state basically to to have the canons of the church as laws. So I think the situation in Greece is something of um, a good situation. In Greece, there is, for example, oh, this is a big topic, but there is some laws in Greece. For example, that the state cannot have a law of how the church should function that is against the church own um, view of the thing. So the church, the state cannot have a law that says the church uh, should not uh, have communion with a spoon, wherever, you know, they can't, they can't do it. It's a church thing, but it needs also to be grounded in the law, in the civil law, because mm -hmm. Elsewhere, one crazy politician can uh, have uh, this idea that, oh, I can do whatever I want with the church. That's not the case. So this is, it should be a dialogue, you know. Yeah, that's basically the, uh, the and if you, we can speak specifically of how the priest 
the priest is getting paid from the state in Greece. Okay, so this is the question that can a priest have a second job? Because in Greece you can only have one full time job from the state. And the, the, canonic, the, the law here says, yes, he can have a second job because to be a priest is not a job in this sense. Uh, however, the priest is under I, the... My cat's an Anglican priest. Oh, <laughs> yeah. My cat's an Anglican priest because she's a female and she's yeah. a total heretic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but the, the priests in Greece are under the how do you say the uh, the penetration laws? How do you say Pene, um, um the the law that enforce you know if you do a crime or something like that. So, for example, the priest if he do, does a fake baptism certificate, then he's under the law because you cannot do it. You cannot just write fake things. But the priest is not under the law in the sense that he has a secular job. So this is some distinctions that exist in Greece. I'm sure there are some in Russia too. But yeah. All right, we got a quick question. I'll answer real quick. Who wrote the scripture? God through the agency of man. <laughs> yeah. All right. So um, let's see. We have. This I mean, who wrote? Uh, yeah, I mean, you can also also say who wrote the book you, the, the person that asked this question, if he writes a book, you can say who wrote this book? And the answer would be the soul through the agency of the body or something. It looks like there's someone, and I, here's the thing, I don't ban anyone from the questions here. I don't know how to. <laughs> it looks like someone's <laughs> arguing back and forth with people and then like none of their comments are showing up or everyone's just imagining this person's comments. So it's just... Funny, kind of funny to see this, and I don't know why it's happening. Um, yeah. What would your dream bathroom look like? Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. Mr. Yeah. <laughs> and I would do. I don't know. Um, then it's clean, and I don't have to clean it. Um, you you got to you got to love. Um, you got you got to love some of these questions. Let's yeah. see. And look. She subbed to the channel. What are we talking about? Elaine, we're talking about Orthodox Christianity. Not, you know. We're not doing a good job, Craig. I, I plan on adding new light fixtures to my bathroom. I hope that means something, right? My wife is an electrical engineer, so I hope she does it. Oh. <laughs> I don't want to do it. <laughs> I hate electricity, by the way. I'm so afraid of electricity. When there's thunder, I'm like, like going under the bed and like shaking, <laughs> you know. Very godly of me, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, um, well I think to ask a more serious question. What was the Pax Romana or the Peace of Rome? Um, I alluded to quickly that how the church became split onto provincial lines. We I also alluded to early in this show when Rome started falling apart, it led to this actual schisms and and the encroachments in territory from the uh, Sassanid Empire, and that kind of broke the church apart as well. So there's something to be said. The Roman nationalism's from the 19th century, right? So this idea that um, people go, oh, I'm Roman. I mean, St. Paul actually did that, but he also, I'm a Jew. I'm the tribe of, what tribe was Paul from? From the tribe of Benjamin, if I remember right. I think he says in, uh, in Philippians that he's from the tribe of Benjamin. And so he had other ethnic alliance, you know, uh, ethnically aligned himself with, Judaism and not with being Roman because being Roman wasn't a race, right? So what was being Roman? It was a, it was an empire mostly held together by tribute. So you read this in the saints' lives. There were local kings, local emperors. But they're all part of the Roman Empire. They weren't always the emperor of Rome, but you would recognize you have this local king. We see this in the Bible. Herod was a king, but he was a client king of the Roman Empire. So you could have a king um, of your lands, but you still are part of the Roman Empire. So you're really your own country. Your country pays tribute to Rome. And so what Rome was, was essentially, pardon me, I'm not European, but it was like the European Union of the past. And Germany and yeah. France was Italy. <laughs> All right? <laughs> that's pretty much what Rome was. You know, Germany and France decide everything in the EU. And, that's, <laughs> and so pretty much yeah. that's what Italy was in the Roman Empire.
And but it wasn't lovey dovey. So like if Rome wanted to extract tribute from you so they could build things of Rome and build a bigger armies for themselves, they didn't feel bad about it. And that's how most empires have worked throughout history. But it created stability because Rome wanted trade. So when they took over Hellenized Egypt, um, it went to utter disrepair. And so the Romans um, repaired a canal. They, were, they built cities um, for trade that went all the way down to Ethiopia, even south of Ethiopia, all the way to India. That's how they would get silk and different products from the east to Rome. So it meant uh, infrastructure improvement, just like in the movie Life of Brian. What did the Romans ever do for us? They built schools. They built roads. You know, all this stuff like we see in the Life of Brian. Um, that was the piece of Rome was – that people for selfish reasons in Italy wanted to one, make it where they don't get sacked by foreign countries because Rome didn't have walls until I think the third century AD. So they wanted a strong military and they also wanted to take over other lands so they could pay for their welfare class back in the city of Rome itself, right? And if that meant improving roads, if that meant improving cities, creating stability, then so be it. Another thing to be added is Rome patronized local religions. So the local pagan religions were patronized and given money. Even local Christianity before the existence of, before Constantine, was treated in the same way as long as they would be loyal Roman subjects. So this idea, there's no real idea of separation of church or state. So they would delegate things to the local religious authorities to take care of charity and, and stuff like that. And to some extent, that's how patriarchs like in Alexandria became almost kings themselves. So that's what's part of the Pax Romana, and Christianity grew under that Pax Romana, so much so um, that later interpreters like Dante, from Dante's Divine Comedies of fame, believed that the Roman Empire was ordained by God, you know, because the Christian religion spread because of the Roman Empire. And to be fair, there's some biblical merit for this. We see... And hopefully my uh, video hasn't gone away because uh, um, who knows what's going on. But that being said, um, I show that I have internet here that the Pax Romana, um, I'm super distracted from John leaving the feed, that we see that, and eh, whatever. Rome created stability and Christianity grew under that, but Christianity also grew, grew outside the Roman Empire, but because it was such a Roman phenomena historically, all the bishoprics and stuff were formed along mostly Roman provincial lines. All right, so I'm gonna click new comments, guys. Let me know if for whatever reason I'm cut off. Um, I hope I'm not. I'm gonna just check my internet here and looks like it's working. So supposedly my internet's working. Um, so I don't know what's going on in this live video and uh, I'll just keep going. Um, we have this question here, um, not just about the Pax Romana. Um, what's your view? Oh, I think, I think the internet is cut here. So I'm gonna... Hello, I... John. Were you taking over for me when I did? That... Hey, John. I don't know what happened, but what? We'll, we'll just roll with it. Because... I, my internet is uh, having problems. Yeah, it's me. I, oh. I don't think it's you. Oh, because mine disappeared for a you second. You have a good too. internet. Oh, this is what happens live with a, oh. a zero dollar budget. So, what's your view on Halloween? <laughs> yeah. Um. I don't know. I know that St. Nikolai Zika was against it. But then I feel bad for my kid not to be able to do it, but he's not old enough for to worry about it. Uh, is there Halloween at all in Greece? Hey, John, you there? John, hello? Yeah, I found out that there is... Uh... Yeah, do you hear me? Yeah, I hear you. Yes, do you hear me? Yes. Uh, hello, John. I hear you, but your internet's very choppy. Yeah, sorry. That's a blessing. Do you hear me now? Yeah, keep you talk. <laughs> yeah. 
So, <laughs> so uh, in Greece, before the, there is the fasting period in uh, Lent, there is some kind of Halloween uh, going on. I don't know. It's the, like a carnival. So I think Jordan, uh, Jordan Pejo speaks about this subject uh, quite a bit. Uh, he had some interesting thoughts about this. But, you know, I, when I was growing up, I, I, my father and mother didn't have any rules like this whatsoever. So I was, but uh, when I was, you know, becoming more Christian and aware, I stopped having Halloween, but I could feel like to have something orange at the window is not, you know, it's like when St. Paul says, should we eat the meat of the, uh, that the, the offering of meat to different gods. And he says, well, don't basically, but, you know, in the end, there, 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 it's, you know, everything is from God, you know, all, all meat, God meat. But yeah. But my conscience forbids me from celebrating Halloween. Yeah, so that's where I am. Yeah. I don't hear you. When, when my when my son's old enough, I'm gonna have to actually ask my spiritual father. And uh, I'd say for now, my stance would be on the side, the air on the side of caution. We actually have at least one saint that has talked about it. Um, I feel bad because really there's a non-evil way to do Halloween. There's nothing wrong with community coming together and giving each other candy. But the bad part is dressing up like the devil, right? <laughs> that's the bad yeah. part. So, yeah. um, so that, you know, that's if, what I really disagree about. Yeah, the, the, right. So if like, up, if your neighborhood, I'm just gonna pretend, if every kid that knocked on your door in your neighborhood was dressed as an angel or as a pirate or as a fairy or as a cartoon character, it was just fun, then you could call it Halloween. The word don't matter. Then it don't matter. But if there's some – this dead skulls and all this stuff that, that, that come from sin, right? Death comes from sin, then I don't see how it could be good. But, um, you yeah. know, I can see where there's a – Fun part of it, but being that we have a saint saying we don't want to be part of this, I'm going to say caution means no, but I'd speak to your priest about it. Um, Son of Seth keeps asking a question I can't answer because I don't understand it. Why do non Catholics depend so much on mediators as compared to East Orthodox? Um, I think I, I saw it answer, asked the first time. We both pray to saints and to our guardian angel um, respectively, as well, different guardian angels um, for intercession and prayer. And even they could heal and stuff like that. So I'm not quite sure of the question. I'm going to guess we're like the Oriental Orthodox in that sense. Um, we have this. Um, great video. Are you going to talk again with Subdeacon Daniel? Now, I think he's Deacon Daniel now. Um, I hope, I hope so. Um, and just don't know when, like, I'm off today. This is Columbus Day in the United States, at least for now. And um, and John's like, let's do a stream on, uh, you know, just Q&A. And so, like, okay. So, um, but I regularly work a normal eight to four job. So does uh, Deacon Daniel. And he's in California, so there's a time zone issue. But I hope to be doing something with him soon. Um, we have a greetings from Indonesia. And... Great. So happy, so happy to have viewers in Indonesia, um, and we have. Uh, I there's one real kind guy, um, Heraculus, who contacts me. I don't want to get it wrong. I think he's Indonesian, might be Malaysian, whatever. Whole area, I'm always Cambodian. They're all the same thing in my book. They're just different countries and different languages. Um, well, being that we are out of questions for today, I'm going to just share screen on. Um, what I always ask for is donations to the Orthodox Church in Cambodia if this show has blessed you. Now, if it hasn't blessed you, you don't have to donate a penny. But if it has blessed you, help grow the Church of Cambodia or donate to your local monastery. Um, this is brand new. This website you're looking at was made by Father Paisi. It's ko-fi.com, like coffee. Dot com slash Orthodox Mission in Cambodia. So coffee.com slash Orthodox Mission in Cambodia, KO-FI. Um, and you could um, support the church in Cambodia, learn more about it here as well. 
um, you could support by donating both $1, $100, $300. If you want to pay for um, the new parish for one month in Sim Reap, they cost $300 have worship and rent a building there. Um, you could do it one time. You could do it monthly, right? So you could tithe regularly you want, and it goes to the church in Cambodia. For now, due to PayPal, I am still the middleman. I still have to personally money gram the money to Cambodia. Um, I might uh, set up a bank account in a Ukrainian bank and wire it directly to the Moscow Patriarchate or, or do it on their behalf or something like that. But the point is, if this show has blessed you, you could go and support regularly the Orthodox Church of Cambodia. You could consider yourself a subscriber or a patron of this show by supporting the Church of Cambodia by going to ko-fi.com slash Orthodox uh, Mission in Cambodia. Also, if you want to just do it more old school with PayPal, you could go to orthodoxchristiantheology.com slash donate, and that link is also there at orthodoxchristiantheology.com slash donate. But I don't do this for the money. I'm just happy having this conversation, not only with John, with all you guys here, helping everyone um, else who's here. Um, and so, John, your channel is According to John. We're going to put it. It's not here in the description yet because it's like such a long channel name. <laughs> when he gets more viewers, he could get a more succinct name like mine's YouTube.com slash Orthodox Christian Theology. Um, but please watch According to John. He's an up and coming Orthodox YouTuber. Um, he's getting a lot of great guys. You're getting a bishop on. You have a priest on. Um, you're getting some real good um, shows on, and I want everyone to follow you as well. Is there any other plugs that you would like to make, or you want to plug your own channel in your own words? No, not really. <laughs> All right, so that's good old John. Um, yeah. We had one last question before we go. Any good Orthodox resources for Orthodox who are speaking with Mormons, apologetic type? Um, I'm not aware, actually. The Holy Spirit, yeah. Yeah, the Holy Spirit. It's. I think you might be more stuck with Protestants like James White, who has done a lot uh, to dealing with Mormons. Um, I haven't dealt that much with Mormons. Um, our, it might help to understand Orthodox view and theosis, which is totally different than theirs. We believe we're becoming dispassionate. We believe we are becoming God according to his energies. We don't believe that we're going to become uh, like different gods, lowercase g, like entities, um, but it's not something I've got into a lot. I might get increasingly into apologetics against Jehovah's Witnesses um, simply because it's a topic I really like. And we have a, a great ex Jehovah's Witness who um, has been on our show once before. And I hope to do that again. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, I wish I had more. But if it comes up, we will definitely update you on it in the com box. Well, guys, it's been great having um, you guys watching today on a Monday or listening at work or however you do it. Um, I like to end all my shows by quoting Sirach 428, fight to death for the truth, and the Lord God will fight for you. God bless you. Have a great day.